something to eat or drink this morning you haven't cup of coffee perhaps a cup of water lemon anything nothing but you did have something yesterday and the day before and the day before that of course to stay healthy to stay vibrant rejuvenated enthusiastic you must eat daily what you eat when you eat how you eat how you prepare what you eat, where you procure what you eat, and how much you spend on it is up to you. But everybody who is living eats something on a daily basis. So you can imagine how it will feel when you eat something that should make you healthier, stronger, more vibrant. And then you get to know or you begin to suspect based on how you feel or what you hear or what you see uh, that what you have put in your body for healthy living is going to be counterproductive. And uh, the word worrisome came up several times in our discussion before we birth this topic, adulterated food and beverages. Welcome. It's great to have your company. It's a week and deal. Not to alarm you, but to inform you, to educate you, to enlighten you and to ensure that we all have the same perspective which is right about our edibles about what we procure and eat and uh, we are concerned about what we imbibe and what we urge others to also take in we also had a very special interview with the chief judge of the federal high court of nigeria honorable justice john Dehemba. The whole. And we're talking about the 16th a Maritime a Seminar for Georges. All this and more on Weekend Do Today. You just have to stay. My name is Thelma Obaze. Weekend Do. Weekend Do. And it's a special package that will bring for you, especially as it comes up once every two years. I'm talking about the 16th International Maritime Seminar for Judges. And I have the pleasure to be having this chat with the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court of Nigeria, Honorable Justice John Dehemba Soho. It's a pleasure to be having this chat with you. Oh, it's my pleasure too. You're welcome. Honorable Justice, what impact has the International Seminar for judges made in the education of maritime related claims in the past years. The maritime seminar has had tremendous impact on the judges in the sense that it's a form of continuing education for them in order to update their knowledge of the maritime industry and the law as it relates to it. And of course, the essence is to harmonize their knowledge with international best practices, because the maritime industry itself is international business. It's international in scope. And so it cannot fare well where a country simply isolates itself uh, from interacting with other stakeholders in the industry. The seminar is aimed at tapping from the experience and knowledge of those other advanced economies. And the judges have learned over the years, realizing that 
the maritime cases are not like just any other ordinary cases of contract which can be adjourned at will because they have to be speedily tried since humongous amounts of money are usually involved because what is at the center of it is shipping business and a ship is such a very huge investment and the detention of it for just one day can do a whole lot of damage in adjudicating such cases, you don't unduly try to favor local litigants because you have to also be fair to foreigners or international litigants. Otherwise, the, in the industry will be easily killed in your own country because if people perceive that they come to your, if they come to your country, they will not be fairly treated, then they, they, they will shy away. It's interesting to learn that it's a level playing field. That's what everybody wants at the end of the day. But let's talk about the knowledge that has been impacted uh, on the Superior Court judges. This is the 16th uh, international um, seminar. How far so far? It has been well, uh, which is why you, you have um, foreigners involved because their sheer participation goes to demonstrate that uh, it, it's working, the intended purpose is being achieved, but more importantly, well, the, in the maritime industry, it's the Federal High Court that is a court of first instance and has exclusive jurisdiction, which is why we, our participation is usually robust. And the involvement of even appellate judges has gone a, a long way to enlighten them, such that decisions of Nigerian courts have come to be reckoned with internationally and actually commended. Because it's a buy now, that's once every two years, so we can say that uh, it's been ongoing for 32 years so far. Would you say, Honorable Justice John Tehemba, that the objective for this international seminar series has been met? Uh, all the, the brainstorming that has gone by over the years have been uh, put in permanent form and it constitutes some kind of research material and it will help both uh, all stakeholders, practitioners and students of the maritime law and those who participate in the maritime industry generally. So apart from physical learning by the participants, you have some resource material to resort to in terms of research. And it can also help, all that can help in formulating government policy. This is the 16th uh, international seminar series. What is unique about it? 16 can be like 15 or 14. Well, it's unique in the sense that the scope of participation has been broadened. In the past, you had countries like Ghana, Togo, and some neighboring, a few other neighboring countries. But this time, the spread is wider. We have participants even from Uganda. And of course, the topics to be considered are also wider. Uh, they go into in-depth discussion of issues arising from the uh, industry. The shipping industry can't do without the ports. It also goes into discussion of issues of maritime security because you usually have incidences like pirating, and even robbery on the high seas. What makes it unique, in essence, is the expansion in participation and expansion in the areas or topics to be covered. Would you say we're standing tall in terms of maritime law as a result of this series? Can the other countries on the African continent look up to us and say, yes, because Nigeria did it this way, and we copied or we learned from it in terms of maritime law, what are the better for it? At the risk of being immodest, 
<laughs> I think that's the more reason why the other neighboring countries are readily responding to our invitation because one, to uh, even have the drive to organize something like this consistently is a plus for us. And that is to say that the, there is commitment towards development of a strong maritime industry. We have a large uh, coastal portion of Nigeria's littoral state. We should naturally have more commitment to maritime activities. Of course, you have some of the African nations that are landlocked. Even if the, their intention is to develop uh, in the maritime industry, that the, the opportunity will be limited. What would you say the impact, talking about the international uh, seminar series for judges in terms of maritime law, what would you say the impact has been on the Nigerian economy thus far? After all, it's been 32 years. You certainly have some impact, though it may not be as far-reaching as one would expect. And if by the maritime seminars you have succeeded in drawing attention to the Nigerian uh, maritime industry, then it's something to applaud. Anything you organize that attracts the international community Certainly, we pose a country and also bring in some financial benefits because people come in, of course. Some, we, if they lodge in hotels, that is uh, some income for those hotels. Some may go into other businesses and it also provides a potential for investment. Maybe people may now be opportune to see what is on ground, and if they are impressed, it, it, they will certainly come in. And of course, the maritime industry is actually an income spinner because of the large volume of trade and business that is involved with it. And usually the transactions are in hard currency. With every big thing, and this is a big deal, an international uh, seminar series, for maritime law, there are the advantages, there is the good side, there's the other side of the coin, which could bring up challenges here and there. Would you say there are any challenges in terms of maritime law adjudication in Nigeria, as well as uh, the series? Well, there are obviously challenges in the maritime industry where you have um, an industry with international participation, uh, those that are more developed might tend to uh, sort of put uh, the lesser developed economy at a disadvantage while advancing their own interests. That in itself is a, is a problem. Maritime industry involves a lot of contracts and all that, and usually in those contracts, they, they incorporate what they call um, arbitration clauses. And one typical feature of it is to indicate that if there is a, a dispute, there should be a place for the venue for arbitration. And usually the Foreign, foreigners or international uh, stakeholders who prefer foreign venues such as uh, London and uh, Washington and all that. And, and you know, the, that means if a Nigerian investor has a, a, a dispute with uh, an international counterpart, he now has to take the trouble of going, traveling abroad, and that will involve more expense. If you had, say, Lagos or Abuja as a venue for uh, arbitration, uh, whatever expenditure that is involved with such 
arbitration process. We, we come to our country, but when you go to a foreign country, then the, it means the invest, that, that in, uh, revenue is lost. The operation of ships, ships, uh, high sea going vessels, and from time to time they will need uh, maintenance, repairs, and things like that. But uh, as of now, we don't have uh, well developed docks for repair of ships. Well, attempts have been made. Those are some of the challenges, but uh, we still hope that with time, uh, things will get better. As we wrap up our conversation, um, what are your expectations for the outcomes, positive outcomes of this seminar series on open justice? The expectation is that as we rob minds, some proposals will be made. And of course, the positive side of it is that you have some policy makers involved, they will be in attendance. The Minister of Transport, for instance, is, uh, is the chief host. He will be there among other stakeholders. And what is expected is that at the end of the seminar, there will be a communique. The essence is to address issues and call the attention of those who are directly involved so that the suggestions and proposals that have been put up in the course of the seminar will be followed up for possible implementation. And if implemented, you certainly look forward to some improvement. Honorable Justice, please tell us about the date, uh, time, venue, and uh, indeed who is expected to attend. The date of the seminar uh, is 5th July. The program actually ends on Thursday, the 7th of July, 2022, and it will last for three days. And the venue is the Sheraton Hotel, Abuja. And those expected, uh, the Minister of Transport, who is the chief host, then you have Honorable Justice Bodero Zviva, who is a retired justice of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. And then you have His Lordship, the acting, the chief justice of Nigeria, Honorable Jasolu Kayode Ariwola, who is a special guest of honor. And beyond that, you have other chief justices from neighboring African countries and then participants also from those countries. Thank you for your time. Honorable Justice John Tehemba Soho, Chief Judge of the Federal High Court of Nigeria. It's been quite an enlightening uh, discussion. Thank you very much. It's quite my pleasure uh, featuring on this program. Thank you. It's always great to have your company. I would like to hear from you. You do know that our program is interactive and um, we are here because you are. Today, we'll focus on adulterated food and beverages, of course. You just saw our, our chart with the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, Honorable Justice John Tehemba. Um, so we'll get to know what Francis uh, on earth as he did his research talking about adulterated food and beverages and then we'll have a chat with uh, our first guest sending your messages last week on weekend deal our focus was on the proliferation of fake and substandard products in Nigeria Today, Weekendy beams our satellite on adulterated foods and beverages in Nigeria. We have a lot of fake products in the, in the country today. Even the fish we eat, they have fake titles fish in Nigeria. They have fake everything. The size of adulterated food in Nigeria is huge. Even palm oil, 
putting substances, putting things that are not supposed to be there just to be able to increase the size, the volume, so that they can make better money. Okay, it's greed. Look at the issue of Pomona Nigeria. I don't want to go into that. It's a delicacy that people are very, very passionate and sensitive about. But look at the preservation. How do they preserve the country? How do they process it? So the issue of process is also important. It's a delicacy that everybody wants to consume. But you also have to look at the manner in which it is processed. And the manner in which it is processed is injurious, toxic to our health. The problem of adulteration cuts across all sectors. The latest entrant into the group of substandard products in the country is adulterated yam flour as far back as 2017. Our zobo banned, beans banned, smoked fish banned, sesame seed banned. Why? Because we are not doing the right thing. Beans is banned from Nigeria by most countries, if not all. You know the reason? Because when you get these beans to their place, you see they use all kind of chemicals, all kind of banned substances to preserve or even grow the, the product beans. Now, if you take any one of those things, any one of those beans sample, you can't trace where it's coming from in Nigeria. It's impossible. And that is what is killing us. Food product, food item, the issue of sanity, factory sanity comes in. The issue of packaging comes in. The issue of the requirement of the country you are exporting to comes in. All these have to be put together. Nobody, nobody compromises health, how the altars of, you know, business or market or whatever. So that balance will have to be there. And that's why the food item is the most regulated in the world, even in the international market. That's why you have that agreement. When Nigeria and Biscuit Flowers were, was rejected by Mexico, it wasn't on the basis of quality. It was on the basis of certification, documentations and what have you. The rate at which expired and adulterated food products flood markets across Nigeria is a source of concern. Unfortunately, farmers' productivity is greatly impacted by the sale and use of fake or adulterated seeds and fertilizers. If the EU is saying that our beans in terms of chemical residues is excessive, does not meet the, and is not fit for consumption, why will you in Nigeria patronize that? Why will you in Nigeria consume that product? Simply because nobody is paying attention to that. So if you are serious about our health, then we should also be serious about what we consume. But we are not paying attention to that. All we are paying attention is that Nigerian products is rejected for this reason, for this reason. But why in the first instance do we, even our own, consume that product? Due to the low production of organic foods and its scarcity, this has led to the use of chemicals such as calcium carbide to ripen fruits such as orange, mango, banana, and plantain. We find that Nigerian pineapple is the most durable, it lasts longer, and it tastes better. But if you go to Europe today, over 70% of the pineapple they eat comes from Costa Rica, the rest from Ghana. Zero from Nigeria. Most of also are agricultural products. They are also perishable products. And you know the treatment of perishable products. And I also want to emphasize uh, in WTO Trade Agreement on what should be done to perishable products in terms of expedited treatment. That whenever you come to perishable product, you must give it as expedited treatment in terms of the clearance, in terms of documentation, export and whatever. But you must put them in good shape including storage facility, warehouse, and the rest for those who to be able to maintain its form. If you consume penapu from Costa Rica, you can trace it to Costa Rica, and you are sure this is penapu from Costa Rica. The same way with other countries, Argentina, Brazil, and the rest. Therefore, every country has that kind of a standard traceability and what have you to enable you to know that this product is from this country. You would not even want to check it. You will consume it. Is it mango? Is it fruits and what have you? Despite various efforts by the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, Standards Organization of Nigeria, and other agencies to combat the threat, the Nigerian market remains flooded with unwholesome fake beverages and drinks. We came up with them. Um a system we've already built, ready to be launched. It's called traceability. That means 
anything you buy in the market, you can trace where it's coming from. If you cannot trace where it's coming from, it's just a very simple system with the apps on your phone. If you can't trace, don't buy it. You heard about the case of federal government checkmating people frying Akara. I oh, am yeah, on the street with the uh, transformer oil. <laughs> Imagine frying food you sell to people with transformer oil. Wow. See, so this greed of making money, people want to make money by all means. When you come to the issue of adulteration, the first thing is that who has that responsibility to ensure that it does not happen? And if it happens, how do you deal with that? That must be sanctioned you know, for every infraction. Your national standard should not in any way undermine the international standard. So your national standard must be built around the international standard. Because if you focus only on your national standard, you can export. The frequent report of adulterated food and food poisoning calls for urgent attention. Therefore, our focus on Weekend Deal today will be on adulterated foods and beverages. Francis has set the tone for our conversation today. Adulterated food and beverages in Nigeria is our concern and is our focus. Let's get to meet Honorable Tanko Yusuf Sununu. He's a medical professional, he's a doctor, and he's also been facilitating, working assiduously in the house, uh, talking about a bill. Tell us about that bill. Let's take it from there. Welcome to Weekend Deal. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate once more the Nigerian Television Authority for your uh, always trying to keep people guided. In fact, let me borrow from Nabda, safeguarding the health of the nation. The issue of energy itself, because it's the world around this thing, and most importantly is the counterfeit fake drugs and also some food products. Yes, indeed. We like where you're going, but let's go to Benin, where there's talk about fake palm oil, fake vegetable oil, or are they really fake? Benin, please share what you found. Mission Road and Ekioba, popularly known as Oba Market in Benin City, are some of the places one can find palm oil and vegetable oil, which are the major ingredients used in cooking most Nigerian dishes. Edo State is home to some of the major palm oil and vegetable oil producers, both industrial and local. However, there are reports of adulterated palm oil and vegetable oil in the state. Since I saw it, it's not 31 years when I saw it. I don't know, I don't know that fake one. Now, yeah, now, now they mostly sell pass for you. I sell better. Because of the fake people are saying, but I don't, I have not seen it. I normally go for this uh, bangal, yeah, but it's too expensive now. The price is high now. I say go for it. What do I do? Because of the effects that is in uh, this, uh, this one, now, they say they used to miss uh, colored, mixed with colored, they mixed it up with uh, this uh, normal uh, our native oil. It's true, some people used to bring fake oil. Yeah. We monitor them. We don't allow them to sell it in the market. We buy the hero or lajonic oil. They will not carry it, transfer it to King's uh, 25 liter. They will not do it. And when people, when, people, when people buy it, they will not discover that it is fake. And now they are helping us now to spoil the name of the oil. It is true that some people adulterate the edible uh, palm oil. I can give an example from my own side. I, I, I knew of somebody that my wife was selling her oil palm to. And one day she got to go and meet her for, to, to get her money after supplying. I met her missing a lot of uh, jerry cans, Mixing them, and my wife and I said, are, are you missing chemical with uh, oil? And I said, ah, we don't do that, we'll not get plenty again. How then can one identify adulterated palm oil and vegetable oil? And who are those behind this unwholesome act? The red will be like blood. You know, see white something like this. White you know, see, no, your reds. This is natural. Oil. 
if you cook with it, maybe you fry uh, something with it and keep it for a long time, the way it will look like, you will also be an adulterated. Uh, you use oil cook, you must know whether it's good oil or not. Because the face of the food will tell you how the oil is. Be. You see the vendors go to various markets in a do state. Most of them, I said most, are the one championing this adulterated oil. There is a chemical that is being imported from China. They have to eat, they recook and they sell. Checking the activities of those engaged in adulterating palm oil and vegetable oil should be a priority as it concerns human health. Many people have been complaining. If they bought it, they will cause, ah, see this oil is not like the oil we bought day before yesterday. Huh? Yesterday, we will follow that person to the place he bought the oil. So we will tell that person, don't bring it here again. What are the consequences for those engaged in this act? And when we sit there like that, we seize the oil. Uh, at the time I was a tax force chairman, we went around, destroyed this thing. Health is wealth. Therefore, efforts should be doubled to ensure that adulteration of palm oil and vegetable oil is a thing of the past. That's from Benin talking about adulterated palm and vegetable oil. Honorable Dr. Tankul Yusuf Sununu is here. And let's talk about uh, yeah. what are we putting in place to deter people? Because oftentimes, even if some foreigners may be involved, they must be colluding with people who are meant to be patriots who bear the identification um, a Nigerian and they know that their citizens will be taking some of these products in. We'll continue with our conversation. Dio put together a package and she's talking about the liquids now, water, soft drinks, alcoholic drinks. Dio, what did you find? Tell us more. Please, parents, you just have to be careful. Before giving your children anything, any juice to drink, please make sure you check it very well. Very frightening and alarming. Though the video is not verified, but it is a common occurrence in Nigeria now. The constant influx and proliferation of these fake drinks and beverages in the Nigerian market is generating a lot of anxiety among Nigerians. We have experienced uh, uh, bad water, especially this sachet water. Sometimes when you are taking it, most especially if it is not chilled, you will experience some bad, bad odor coming out of it. And if you look at it carefully, you see some particles inside. In terms of uh, alcoholic drinks, like beer for instance, there are people who go to fake those drinks from their little, little hideouts. I have interfaced with a lot of people that says each time they take beer, they get a lot of headache. But the one that is brewed from the original background doesn't give that. Recently, at Okeari Market in Lagos Island, a fake manufacturer was arrested by the police for production of adulterated alcohol drinks. When you adulterate something, it simply means you've changed the natural state of that thing or that food to an artificial state and there are too many things you do when you adulterate things you reduce the quality of life of that thing you also introduce foreign things to it so in other words it's either you're doing it to harm the next person or you're doing it to increase the shelf life of that particular thing which at the end of the day becomes toxic to the health similarly in april 2017 the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAFDAQ, raided the Ogbaru Relief Market near Onicha and arrested eight persons over their alleged involvement in the production of fake alcohol drinks. Truth is, let people buy their fruits and watch them ripen on their own. It mustn't be ripe, ripe, ripe all the time. If you have so much sweetening test for ripening fruits, why don't you take that patience within yourself? When you watch your fruits, listen, it becomes as ripe as you want it to be. Now, leaving it to the care of someone you do not know. We want both they that do these things and we that consume. Let's be conscious. Conscious of our health, conscious of what we are doing. And know that the, the society does not need ailing Nigerians. If we are all healthy, 
it becomes benefit for all of us. Despite the various efforts by the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration in control, NAVDAC, and other agencies to combat the menace, the Nigerian markets remained flooded with different unwholesome fake drinks and beverages with stories of many unfortunate victims. There was a story of a young man called AJ in Ayobo area of Lagos who was rushed to hospital after complaining of severe stomach ache. He revealed that all he had taken that day was a sachet of dry gin. After investigation, it was discovered that he had food poisoning caused by drinking the fake version of a brand of gin he took. They gave me some gadgets I put on. I they went inside the production, so they showed me how they do carry out their production. So they were able to convince me beyond every reasonable doubt that that one I brought uh, was fake. Uh -huh. So I saw it myself. To reverse this ugly trend, members of the public should endeavor to give information to security and other monitoring agencies if they suspect any illegal or unprofessional production of drinks and beverages in their localities. Besides, there must be stiffer penalties for producers and promoters of fake drinks and beverages. Right before our eyes, talking about adulterated drinks, liquids now, even water. Someone talks about you take water and there's this aftertaste, which we know was not uh, or is not meant to be the case let me take one message here good morning it's no longer news in nigeria today that adulteration of, of almost everything we consume may be the primary reason why life expectancy is going down thank you for educating nigerians from yam azi makadi also we hear about uh, something that happened in kano they say 10 people uh passed on it was fatal from consumption of um, liquids, juices. Now, someone talked about stiffer penalties. Daya was just talking about stiffer pen penalties in line with our earlier discussion. Can we put a cap on that, Honorable? Uh, I think I think for, let me mention, Kano, let me also, uh, first of all, uh, commend the effort of the Kano state government. If you look at the current act that we have, it provided for national tax force, and then state tax force and then police squad that will all work together to see how they can arrest the issue of adulterated drug, fake drugs and all uh, products. Kano as it is today because they have seen the menace of what is happening and it's also becoming another market for adulterated product. The Kano state government has really done very well. I must commend Kano state government. Kano, Lagos and very few states that I know as a committee chair are doing extremely well as far as that is concerned. And that's why, if you can recall, even when the issue of drug abuse came into the country, there is a seminar that was also conducted in Kano. Because uh, Kano is just like Onisha in the country. It also serves as a lot of point of entry for source of food and food product, so also drugs to most part of the northern Nigeria. So for that, the state tax force and the federal tax force are working hand in hand, even in uh, this thing. So. The penalty, as I mentioned, that's why I have to look at it closely and see how can we amend that law and make it such it can serve as deterrent. You've called it a national emergency. We continue our conversation. We go to Lagos, where from NTA in Victoria Island, they've gone out to the streets, grills, the charcoal being used. You have findings. Please share with us. Those are the sights and sounds that characterize the commercial nerve center of the country, Lagos. For an average resident of the busy city, this is an experience they have to deal with on a daily basis. To survive this strenuous experience of the hustle and bustle of a city like Lagos, most residents resort to eating on the go, thereby providing business to many roadside food vendors. If you look at virtually everybody working in Lagos, there's no time to say you want to cook or anything. Uh, you know, you need something to quench your taste immediately. So going to these things is just the best way, you know, as per Lagos standard. We need the cheap life. We need the fast life. 
So the fast life and the cheap life is where we get our suya, where we get our chops and the rest. So even though it's not healthy, but at least we are still moving small, small. Questions have been raised as to the safety of the processes and preparations of such meals. And it is often feared that food poisoning or contamination could have taken place in the handling and processing of such meals. However, this has not reduced the rate of consumption. They just sell food and then people keep buying. And the fact that maybe they are adding this and that, is, I cannot say it is not true. Because sometimes you see some food that they'll be so like some soup, they'll be so red dish. And you'll be imagining because that same pap oil that you and I do buy from the market that we use in our homes. And at the end of the day, you find that it just looks just the normal way. But when you come out, you see food vendors, the way they display theirs. Sometimes it's so, it's, so, it's so worrisome. This medical practitioner further warns on the danger of persistent consumption of adulterated foods and suggested ways of surviving in the midst of the buzzes of city life. It is unfortunate that many people are eating poison because all these ethanol, all these chemicals that you are seeing, it's damaging organs. You now find out that sometimes when you like try to look at the background of the problem, you don't even know what actually goes on. We know we can buy at home. We should try as much as possible to buy and plan. If you sleep early, you wake up early to prepare your meal. And the distilling and formatting is killing. Food safety experts further educate on how best to handle this food preparation without any contamination that could lead to serious health hazards. There is a particular chemical compound that is present in charcoal and it is called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, basically they are present when coal is being burnt. But what happens is that when you grill your fish and the fats from your fish start dripping into the, into the fire, you have smoke. And what this smoke does is that it releases large amounts, high concentration of this polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and which can cause diseases. It's important to know that when you are grilling, do not just expose your food to the direct flame. You can do it with aluminium foil and also try your possible best to reduce the consumption of these grilled foods because you cannot determine the concentration, the level of concentration you are consuming. There are some substances that can occur and these substances are called heterocyclic amines. What these substances do is that they can cause DNA damage thereby leading to cancer. Needless to say, healthy living habits and lifestyle are crucial to healthy living. And as the saying goes, eat to live and not leave to heat. My NTA in Lagos, talking about Victoria Island, the wind under the streets. Eat to live, not live to eat. Mm. If you are eating to live, what are you eating to live? You must be very conscious of what you are eating, how you are eating, where you are eating. Honorable Dr. Sununo, speak to that, please. Well, I think the issue now is uh, well, definitely it has to go back to our economic basis. There is extreme poverty in the country, and that is really freaking our distance. People try to short, cut short. For example, now, if you look at even processing food, somebody made mention of Pomo and uh, cartel and rest earlier. Now, even in the processing, because the energy in terms of uh, gas now is costly, people want to shorten the duration of time to cook such materials. And they go uh, 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 ahead and add so much large quantity of parastomol so that it can easily be cooked and soft. That is also another danger. Because once the panel reacts, it produces a chemical that will go and destroy people's uh, liver. Now, what is the way forward? The way forward, is, I said, is to provide a very good legal framework that will serve as a which we are working on and very soon we will get it done. Secondly, the government must also work to ensure that we lift people as much as possible out of poverty. Because at times, you may be forced to buy because that's what you can afford. While we are discussing, you mentioned the issue of uh, pure, pure water. Some may not want to take that pure water, but because such water, but because he has no money to, he or she, to buy a treated bottled water, you just have to resolve to take that. You understand? So we have to lift people out of poverty. We keep this uh, promotion 
of uh, healthy knowledge in motion as we touch down. Thank you for coming on our program, Weekend Dell. Uh, I want to thank you to for helping down. us to safeguard the health of the nation. It's time to touch down with Ayuba. Also did some research live on the streets. Ayuba, tell us more. You would be hard pressed to find any typical Nigerian who doesn't regard instant noodles as the quickest hot meal one can prepare and enjoy. They come in all shapes, sizes, flavors, and brands, and are readily available in all stalls and supermarkets. Little wonder why the average tea seller, aka Meishai, also complements his tea and bread business by preparing instant noodles. But a question looms, just how healthy and nutritious are these noodles, especially if eaten in excess and without concerns of how they are really prepared? I will say noodles has become a go-to food, first of all, because of the inflation. So it's the cheapest still, it's cheaper than rice. It's become a staple meal f for the typical Nigerian. So um, everybody is on a move, everyone's up and doing, and the need to stop on the road and eat something is, you know, beneficial for every day. But is it actually beneficial? That's the question. Uh, roadside noodles um, is for the masses and there are no hygienic measures that are taken. Don't forget um, it's the roadside, as we said, and um, Nigeria has always been known to eat a lot of roadside food but then noodles in particular has a lot of sodium um, and with the growing rate of diabetes in Nigeria um, I'm not one that will support constant eating of roadside noodles. You have the possibility of cholera um, regardless of that myth that when you cook food, it kills all the bacteria, it actually doesn't. Um, so you have all, all sorts of um, poisoning that can happen. So you don't even know what you're picking up. Um, there are no health and safety measures that are being taken where these uh, noodles are being prepared. Not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are various healthy options on how to prepare and enjoy your noodles. There are so many options to, as we say, you can make the ramen style, you can stir fry with healthy oils, um, you can make sure that you have 20% noodles and 80% vegetables. Vegetables as easy as ugu can go into, spinach can go into your noodles and increase the nutritional value. We have uh, spiralized noodles from eggplants. You have tofu noodles, which is w wara. They may, you can make noodles out of that. So um, there are many healthy option noodles. Um, you don't have to go for the expensive vegetables like cauliflower and broccoli. By all means, if you can afford it, 80% of those vegetables on your noodles and 20% noodles gives you a very, very filling noodles. Um, preparation, less of the seasoning that they use in the noodles and more of yours. So I enjoy my noodles with crayfish. So I will alternate crayfish for less seasoning, you know? Add gingers and garlic for people with arthritis when you have noodles, you know, it helps with the muscles. So there are much, much better ways to make noodles at home than the roadside. As hard as it is to take time out to ensure one eats healthy, it is imperative that efforts are made to ensure a proper diet because good health starts with a good meal. And it is with good health that one becomes productive in the society. In Ibadan, there is a wave 
to prevent lava on food crops, rodent droppings, as well as the damage that pesticides can bring to food crops. And there's much talk about greenhouse, greenhouse farming. Enti Badon, share please. Nigeria is one of the leading countries in Africa with the largest level of productivity and profitability in terms of agriculture. Improving nutrition creates a virtuous cycle that helps propel further economic transformation. One of the new methods adopted to achieve these is the invention of the greenhouse farming technology, which makes it possible to grow tropical crops with high yields. In Nigeria, greenhouse farming has come to stay as many farmers have adopted this system of crops propagation as against the conventional way of planting crops. The upward swing of uh, greenhouse farming in your state, I believe with gradual process over the years, we will turn away from our obsolete system of farming and coming into the greenhouse. It gives an opportunity for the production of crops all year round because you know these crops that you are growing or you're culturing in this greenhouse, you know, they are not exposed to the vagaries of the ash or outside weather. So you have like a semi-controlled environment that is stable or constant almost all year round. So these are among some other benefit, I guess that is why um, where people are really, you know, going into this uh, greenhouse production and looking at, um, you know, the small size of space needed for you to produce as much as possible, you know, um, quantity of crops needed at a particular time. A greenhouse farm is considered an implementation of intensive agriculture as it allows the farmers to have more control of creating optimal climate conditions needed for plant growth. How are farmers using this method of farming to improve cultivation? The improvement on the food itself, the way the greenhouse product comes out, always uh, uh, save the consumer, that is the people that is going to heat or consume what we have fed from the greenhouse farming uh, system, give, it brings a healthy, healthy good and improve the body system of the consumers. Of the best way and the best technology we have presently now. Because you can control everything inside the greenhouse. And when you do your calculations very well, you can project what your profit will be and you will attain that. Adulteration or food poisoning have been one of the greatest problems confronting food production in Nigeria, which happens mostly through the use of pesticides, lava on food, and droppings of rodents. However, an expert says the introduction of the greenhouse farming system has been able to tackle this problem. The greenhouse is, um, is a protected facility, so you don't have, you know, most of this, even though sometimes you just want to, you know, ensure that you fumigate where you're using, but you know, they don't have direct touch or direct contact with the plant you are protecting. It could just be around the corner, but this is not something you do all the time. Also, um, you don't have any soil um, that the pesticide or whatever it is you use will be going into, so it also helps, you know, um, um, environmental pollution. What then are the challenges facing greenhouse farming in Nigeria? However, if the government can assist farmers with soft loans to enable them construct more greenhouse farms in the country, the output of farm produce will increase drastically and the country will be self-sufficient in food production. We go to Akure now. There's much talk about cassava processing and the negative input and impact of the use of bleach and uh, other negative chemicals when we're talking about food and what we ingest. NT Akure, you did the work. Show us. Cassava is an important food crop in Nigeria. It is a major carbohydrate staple consumed in various forms. There are different ways of processing this crop, but the common form is the manual way, which can be stressful and time-consuming. This, however, have made some people to devise harmful means to fast-track the production process. It is unfortunate that 
people tend to value money rather than the health of the people that will eventually consume what they produce. Uh, the level of enlightenment of the people, maybe it is poor because they don't know the health implication of what they are doing. They are only using those uh, materials, either bleach or detergent, to hasten the speed at which the materials will be processed before it is ready for consumption. But it is highly dangerous. The people in food technology, the people in engineering, all they need to do is to look at where they can come in and design machines that can assist and reduce the rigor that is involved in using human labor. Do you eat local delicacies made from cassava? Which is your favorite? Kukuru. Okay, so do you know how they make these things? Yes. I even planted some at the back of my yard. And we do make kukuru. We take it to the garlic pro processing uh, factory. We are the translated to kukuru. My favorite? Gary, not Nari Gary, out of it. I have a very big farm. So we used to protect by ourselves. Anytime that one finish, we do another we do another one for consumption. How true is the trend of adding chlorine, popularly known as bleach and other harmful chemicals to the processing of cassava before consumption? I had it last year. Then since that time I'm very careful of uh, eating fufu anyhow. And I believe, you know, we need to desist from this and stop using uh, IPO to soft steam for gari cassava in order to settle the consumer. We got the information sometimes in 2019, uh, which uh, was investigated then by my predecessor. Uh, the places mentioned in the social media report we were visited and uh, we did on the spot assessment. We never discovered the use of those hypochlorite bleach in those facilities visited. And uh, what we did then was to sample some of their products to the lab, and uh, they were satisfactory at the end of the day. Cassava ordinarily should undergo fermentation on its own. I think what the reports try to tell us is that they try to catalyze the process of fermentation. And th these are hazardous chemicals. Bleach, as we know, is to remove stain. They are highly concentrated hypochlorites, which should not be consumed. So what, what we want to tell them is they should desist from such act if they are doing that, uh, because it could lead to a serious hazard on our heads. A lot of things that is happening now, they say it's offer, which is not. It's because of this chemical, tomato chemical, vegetable chemical, everything chemical, it, it have effect on the, the system. I just advise that they should stop. Adulteration of food is a menace to the society and the perpetrators cannot be left off lightly. It is our responsibility as consumers to be careful of what we buy for consumption in order to safeguard our health. Great having your company. Let's do it again tomorrow. From all of us here, it's bye-bye.